In the middle of June in 2023, Amber Stradlin's life ended. The conditions around exactly how that happened are not exactly known, but it has set a community on the path to find justice, to find the truth about what happened. And some of the details that are known are pretty troubling. We know the home this happened in. We have some details about an attack that could have happened there. We have some insight into who was in that home. So why are we here a month and a half later with no arrest and really very little information coming from law enforcement about this case? While rumors run rampant all around this, we're going to try to cut through all that and lean on the information that we can verify through reliable sources as we take a look at this together. Let's start with learning about where this takes place. In what some of you brain scratchers might already consider a strange twist, we're going back to Prestonsburg, Kentucky. And if that name seems familiar, it's because we talked about it several months ago on our coverage about the Candy Green Gonzalez case. Now, we've done an update on that recently. Her remains have been found. Uh, it's not directly related to this case in any way outside of we're going back to Prestonsburg. And today's case is actually going to take place a little bit outside of that, but you'll see that Prestonsburg is pretty square in terms of the heat map. Uh, especially of emotion around this case. Uh, just to retouch on it, Prestonsburg is a small city in and the county seat of Floyd County, Kentucky in the United States. It's in the eastern part of the state in the valley of the Big Sandy River, and the population was 3,255 at the time of the 2010 census. Uh, U.S. Route 23 also called the Country Music Highway to celebrate the region's rich heritage of music runs through Prestonsburg. So a uh, big country music, heavy, heavy influence in this area. It's even been written about in some songs. Let's get right into the articles and see what we can learn. This one from June 19th, 2023. Police are investigating the death of a Prestonsburg woman. Floyd County Coroner Greg Nelson confirmed that the victim was Amber Spradlin, 38 years old. The only other detail Nelson could provide about the incident was that her body has been sent to the state medical examiner's office in Frankfurt for autopsy. Kentucky State Police Post 9 is investigating the death. In a statement, police say that Spradlin's body was found at a home on Arkansas Creek. They add that Spradlin suffered injuries that are believed to be the result of foul play, but provided no additional details. Detective Justin Wireman is leading the investigation into the incident. Um, you know, for a first day, from what I understand, this happened in the early morning hours of June 19th. Um, there's already a, quite a bit of information here on this case. In, in many of these cases, we sometimes won't even get the victim's name uh, when it's this close to the actual incident. So uh, it's also pretty interesting to me that they're being very upfront about the fact that we believe this is the result of, of foul play. This is Amber. This is her Facebook page. Let's just learn a little bit about her from here. She is a hostess at a local restaurant called The Brick House. She went to the David School. Uh, it notes that she does live in Prestonsburg, Kentucky. She's single. And it also talks about her uh, being a fan of cats, I believe. There's a, yeah, here we go. Cousin, niece, cat mom, world traveler, and a music lover. Uh, like, we, like we mentioned about this area, music, a very strong influence here. Uh, let's hit the about page to see if there's any additional information. Doesn't look like it. And this page is a bit locked down. We just have uh, several photos of her, but um, there's really no ability to see, like her friends have been locked down. The posts, I think, have all been locked down at this point. Jumping over to their local ABC affiliate, families, attorneys, and community members exposed what they know about a brutal killing. The incident that led to Amber's death is believed to have happened overnight on June 17th. The state medical examiner confirmed that Spradlin died due to multiple stab wounds. Detectives also interviewed several community members and executed numerous search warrants for homes, electronic devices, and physical evidence, KSP said. Authorities are waiting on DNA testing results, and state police said that they've spent countless hours following false leads and hearsay. And I just really want to call it out very strongly in this video. It's not the intent of me putting up this video to try to generate more buzz for, I mean, hey, look, a big part of this story is 
that 911 communication to 911 and 911 dispatching help in this particular case might have had some issue, some type of breakdown. And honestly, we're going to be asking the question of do we even really have enough detail to make that assessment as we kind of go through this. But um, we certainly don't want to flood these tip lines with a bunch of speculation and things of that nature. So unless you're a person that has firsthand knowledge, like you know something that needs to be called in, uh, this is one of those cases where I just I really ask that people be very, very cautious because um, these detectives are working hard. We're hearing even from the representatives in terms of Amber's family, everyone's on the same page that they think that the, the detectives are doing their best work going about it with everything that they have. Um, so it's one of those things where we don't want to send them thoughts that could pull them away from, you know, really working on this case for a couple hours as they go investigate some lead that they're not sure of. And, you know, small communities like this, there's already going to be a challenge in terms of hearsay. Uh, I'm sure this is a story. If there's 3000 people in Prestonsburg, I'm sure all of them know about this story. All of them are speaking about this story. And through that, there's going to be a certain amount of buzz that's going to generate and people are going to be calling that in. I heard this. I heard that. We don't want to expand the buzz. What we're really trying to do is find someone that might have information. And honestly, who knows who that person could be? Who knows if that person's in Prestonsburg? It could be someone that had a phone call with someone that is close to this case in some way and some information came across to them. So I do think it's important to keep the awareness raised to this case, to speak about it in this type of forum. But I do just want to put out, and their local um, detectives are talking about this. They're just, they're, they're getting flooded with some calls that are really taking them kind of off task in terms of this case. And as we get into the details, you're going to see part of what's disturbing about this is the case seems kind of simple on its face. Like, you know, we know that this is now a stabbing attack. This happened in a home. Who lives there? Who was there at the time? Like, how can this investigation be that complicated? I do believe it is that complicated, and I think you'll believe it too by the time we get to the end of this. But let's go ahead and continue with the articles here. Um, keep in mind, detectives must investigate each tip that comes in, so please only relay credible information. KSP is basically asking for this, the state police. On the night that she died, Spradlin's family said that she was with friends and her boss, people that she trusted. This is definitely throwing this even deeper into a mystery. She's with people she trusts. She's with her boss. Uh, that's why they said that her brutal murder was so shocking. She was stabbed not once, not twice, not three times. She was stabbed 11 times in her head, her neck, and her throat, her cousin Debbie Hall described. Um, Debbie actually gave a lot more detail. It's enough, I think, for me to say it is a brutal attack, um, the type of attack that this was had such an intensity um, that it seems to me it was very clear this this wasn't some simple fight, things are getting out of control. This is uh, someone's decision to end someone else's life. Like the, the level of detail, if you guys want to hear it, I'll have a link to the Facebook um, video that was posted of the family's press conference in the description box down below. You can go ahead and and hear the details there. It's very, very troubling, but I think it's enough to say we're talking a, a tremendous amount of wounds and damage primarily to her face and neck area. The family's attorney, Mark Wollander, believes state police have a suspect, though no suspect has been named publicly. Now, if you don't know anything about this case, all we know so far is her and her boss seem to be together this night. Um, there was another friend that was part of this. I don't know if they were just someone that that hung out at the brick house. Basically, we have the owner of the brick house, we have Amber, and we have someone that's described as Amber's friend. On top of that, there might be other people that were in the home where this happened at that time. And quite honestly, we don't have a solid count. I've kind of heard some things, but I don't feel real strong about it. Um, the, the things that I've been hearing from, uh, you know, Nancy Grace did a podcast on this and they threw out a bunch of information, but they didn't really cite their source. 
Uh, so I, I kind of take that with a grain of salt, but it sounds like it could have been somewhere in the arena of, you know, like five people might have been in the house where this happened. Um, but let's let's put a very big question mark on that. Her family describes Spradlin's upbringing as tragic, explaining that she lost her mom and sister when she was young and she was actually raised by her grandparents. She in turn cared for them until the end. And then she just recently moved out to start a life on her own. She got her own place in town. She got a job. She got her life started. And somehow this evening comes about this, this tragic event on this evening that is really hard to understand. Friends, family, community, that meant everything to Amber, Hall said. The family is also struggling to find out why it took first responders so long to find her. I just don't know what in the world would have gone so wrong to result in what happened. There was a 911 call and no one went, Hall said. Very, very troubling there. And I told you guys at the start of this, there's some issues around the 911 system here. And I think it's important to cover them because I think there's a very important conversation around changes like have happened in this area with their 911 system and the challenges that they faced that kind of made those changes happen. But essentially six months before this occurrence, just in December of 2022, uh, the 911 call center moved from being managed by the state police and it moved into the city's jurisdiction. And it, it's kind of a political hot button, it seems, in this area. As a matter of fact, the attorney that's working with the family, he seems very hot on that particular issue. And I'm not sure that it only comes from him thinking that it might have affected this case. And for me, it's really a big question of, did it really affect this case or not? We just don't have enough detail. The, the tapes haven't been released. And you know sometimes they won't release the tape, but they'll at least release the logs. And they'll be able to say that, hey, we got a call about this instance at this particular time. Oh, then we received another call from someone else about this instance a few minutes later. We don't even have that type of time frame to really understand this, but it appears there's more than one phone call and a significant amount of time that passes between uh, when the first call comes in and when law enforcement actually gets to that house. Um, according to Wolander, it took first responders hours to find her, despite a 911 call after she was stabbed. Prestonsburg Mayor Les Stapleton addressed the issue uh, in a statement. He said that the city of Prestonsburg Police is a stellar organization supported by a stellar 911 center. They offer around the clock police protection 365 days a year, but their priority is and must be the city of Prestonsburg as they are the taxpayers who fund the department's existence. Why is that so important here? Because the house where this took place is actually outside of Prestonsburg city limits. It's kind of in, it's still in the same county, but it's a neighboring area known as Martin. So it's interesting to me. And I, I don't know that I personally feel like this mayor is not the best communicator on issues like this. There's one example a little bit later where I'll show you guys. Um, it seems like once again, this is some type of political hot button issue and it's not bringing out the best in people, particularly when this conversation is being wrapped around the context of a family dealing with a murder of this nature. Um, it's I'm a little disappointed in some of the political heat and play around that topic that I'm seeing when we're talking about the loss of Amber here. But back to his comment, I have total faith in and can unequivocally state that our employees did and continue to do as they always have everything as professionally and adequately as possible. Because this call came from the county, it was supposed to be sent to the state police dispatch center, but it's unclear if that happened, according to the family. And the attorney says, can you imagine being Amber Spradlin in the house that night and no one was coming? It's uh, it's terrifying. It's it's definitely a terrifying thought. And even this kind of mentality of, well, it's outside of the city limits. We have to, you know, give priority to the city. This this statement's very early on. I don't think that at this point um, he had the full scope of what was happening with this issue. And I don't think that we really even understand 
what's happening with this issue. Uh, we're going to find out later. It's not Amber that made the 911 call. So someone else from the house decided to call. What did they say? We don't know. What was the context of that? We have no idea. Did they say that there was a brutal attack and someone had been stabbed multiple times? Um, we don't know if they even phrased it like that. So there's a lot of issues in terms of trying to understand that. But it's just a bit troubling to think that, you know, hey, we've got this other area that's supposed to be serviced by 911, but we're saying that this area is more important because that's where the call center is. Like I'm I'm personally kind of troubled by that. And I know we're talking budgets and other things like that. It's um it's really, really unfortunate that this type of conversation is, is spinning around a case of this nature. Like this type of conversation to me is enough. For someone to have done the footwork and i know we're talking an active investigation and maybe there's elements of those phone calls that are going to be very important to that investigation i have a feeling that that's the case so i understand we're not going to get tapes of the phone calls but could we get someone working as a public information officer that's interfacing with the detectives and can lay out some reasonable understanding to kind of help put this political conversation to the side so everyone could get get focused back on Amber's case. Like that's a step that I think could have happened in some way where the integrity of the investigation could have been protected. The community could understand the issues a little bit more. And it sounds like there's there are some legitimate issues that need to be addressed with this 911 move. I get it. Um, but it's basically the, the silence around this, the lack of information around this, it seems to be adding fuel to the fire. And I don't know that that's fair for Amber's case. That's kind of where I'm concerned. But uh, jumping back into another article, this one from June 19th of 2023 over at WYMT.com. Uh, loved ones of the victim celebrate the life that she lived. Her aunt and uncle, Melissa and Gary Sammons, and her cousin and best friend, Debbie Hall, say that she's someone who most people would say that they know. Everybody always talked about how sweet Amber was and how helpful and nice, said Melissa. Um, you know, we've we've got this restaurant in town. I don't know how popular it is, but she's a hostess at the restaurant. She's going to meet a lot of people in that town very quickly in her time working there. She was kind, said Debbie. She was kind to everyone. After her grandparents died, Spradlin moved out on her own, found a job in town, and began building a new chapter in her life focused on her friends, her pets, and her family. She was kind of just spreading her wings and getting started, said Debbie. It just wasn't fair. She was learning to take care of herself and to be her own person, Melissa said. The family says they're just hopeful that Amber's name will not be forgotten, nor her story swept under the rug. Uh, I just want to touch on this because one of the kind of rumor mill aspects around this is, look, she's at the home of a prominent businessman, right? He owns a restaurant. Not only does he own a restaurant in town, he's also the town's dentist. So immediately, I think people wonder, is there some type of protection going on here? Like, you know, here we are a month and a half later. Yeah, we know it happened in this kind of important figure's home. Why hasn't there been an arrest? There's apparently multiple people that are in this home. Was there a witness? Wouldn't that have been enough? Like if investigators went and they spoke to someone and they said, yeah, I know who did it. It was this guy, Joe, that was there. And this is the item that he used. You would have witness, weapon, uh, and you would you would have the person that you would want to charge and get them arrested and start that process. I don't think you would necessarily need to be waiting for DNA if you had that type of information. So it occurs to me being way outside looking in on this. They must not have that type of information, which gets really strange when you're talking about this type of situation, because you're talking, this took place in someone's home. And what, what you know, this is a person that has some money. Are, are there cameras at that home? Maybe. Would they be indoor? I don't know, not necessarily. But honestly, we don't even know where this attack happened. Maybe they were outside. I don't know. Um, you know, it's early morning hours. I would kind of assume that, that they were inside, but... Uh, is there a security system? Is there some other aspects in terms of the investigation that could be helpful? Possibly. But this is one of those cases that I've talked about before that gets tough when it's inside of four walls. Uh, in particular, I think cases that are usually more difficult in this way are domestic violence related cases 
where there's only two people that are literally in those four walls. That's not exactly what we have happening here. So, uh, you know, in some of those cases, sometimes we see it go a year or longer before there's an arrest because they do need to wait on DNA. They have to get experts in, they have to process all their information and make sure that they've really got their case drilled in. And they're like, okay, we're going to go for the arrest. In this instance, it just seems different to me because supposedly we know that there's at least Amber and two other people, uh, three other people that, that we can confirm that are there. So there seems to be a witness. It just makes me wonder about the possibility of um, someone in the house or maybe everyone in the house not being very forthcoming about what happened. It seems like that's the type of situation that we're dealing with. Seems like, seems like, seems like. I don't know for a fact. It's just with this much time that has passed on, I mean, imagine this. Imagine that this was a case where there was only two people in the house and Amber is brutally attacked. Do you think we'd have an arrest already for the other one person that was in the house at that time? I'm, I'm pretty sure we'd have an arrest. So some there's other, some weird social dynamic or something else going on in this house, I believe that is limiting investigators a bit. Honestly, I believe that more than, oh, this guy's a prominent dentist. He owns our local favorite restaurant and he called a bunch of his buddies and pulled a bunch of strings and you know he's never going to get charged with this. I don't completely discount that possibility. I don't think it should be the first thing we jump to, but I am weary of it. And that's part of the reason why I wanted to raise exposure to this case too, because maybe if this case gets six months down the line and there's no charges laid out for this, that's going to look pretty weird. That's going to look pretty weird for the conditions of a case with of this nature. Um, and I'm sure the family is going to start speaking up in other ways. We can see, I mean, already very early on, uh, we've got protests, we've got community vigils. There's a Facebook page that's up. Um, they're, I'm confident they're going to make sure that this doesn't get swept under the rug in that way. Um, but I do get concerned in situations like this where it's kind of like, yeah, we probably should have had some type of movement at this point. Something seems to be impeding the investigation in some way. Um, are they going to be able to break through that? If if the very few comments that we have heard that they're waiting for DNA information of some kind, like, is that really going to be this, the thing to cinch this when you have so many people that were there? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, over at WYMT.com, demonstration demands justice for Amber. There's been a few demonstrations uh, at this point. With those involved sporting signs, the messages ranged from justice for Amber to what's done in the dark will come to the light. The family said the most important reason for the meeting was to remind the public that the person responsible for her death is still hiding in the shadows. Uh, maybe not even in the shadows. This, this is someone that could be hiding in plain sight. This could be someone that's still part of that community hopping around. Um, and that's a troubling aspect to think of as well. You know, uh, they've, they've taken Amber's opportunity to live and in some way they're still doing whatever they want. Uh, so I, I get that that's really tough for the family to process at all this. The family said they have no intention of delaying the investigation or interfering and just hope to see the person responsible for Spradlin's death pay for the crime. Uh, and I've seen several comments from several different family members. They all seem to be locked on the same page when it comes to that. They know, it seems like they realize there's some challenge here that's slowing things down. It's beyond their control, but they are putting all of their faith in the state police to get this thing cracked. Um, that's very, very strong coming from several different family members. Over at floydct.com, I wanted to make the community aware that there is a murderer in our community and there are people protecting the murderer, said Debbie Hall. This is just a tiny bit of insight, and I don't know how much investigators are sharing with Debbie. Um, Debbie is one of, kind of become one of the main spokespeople for this case uh, in terms of the press conference the family did, in terms of an appearance that she did also on the Nancy Grace podcast. Um, so this is some insight that I think kind of supports one of those concerns that I have about this case, that this happened in a family's home like if it was one of those family members, 
have the others decided that they're going to try to protect that person? Or was it like a friend of the family and the others have decided there seems to be something that is just cluttering this up? With these types of details, if everyone in that house was being honest and open and helpful toward this investigation, I can't imagine that there wouldn't have been an arrest in the first week. I really can't. I think they started to cover up, not expecting us to get involved, she said. And I just want to be clear. I think they're talking about a cover up at that level, like within the house. I don't think we're talking about um, they called the mayor and asked for a favor. You know, like, I, I don't think we're talking about at that level. It's possible. It's, it's definitely possible. But um, I believe the thing that's really bothering, troubling this case is within those four walls. Um, Hall said that her cousin was stabbed and that several people were present at the time of the incident. How could that happen? How, who would just stand around and watch something like that happen? Very, very troubling. The Daily Independent reports no arrest, and that is later in June. Uh, it was largely believed that an individual turned themselves in, but Trooper Michael Coleman says that's only semi-true. Coleman said that an individual came forward to have a conversation with detectives after KSP had difficulties locating them to gain any additional information. I don't want to rush through that. So apparently I'm imagining it's, it could be someone that was in the house. Maybe it's someone outside of the house, but it's someone closely related to someone that was in the house. And all of a sudden they disappear. Uh, and then they show up ready to talk to detectives. The male subject had no warrant or requirement to speak with detectives and wasn't declared a person of interest. Rather, they came in only on their own discretion, Coleman said. Okay, I get that they came in on their discretion, but detectives were asking for them and trying to track them down, and they were having difficulty doing so. I'm not saying the person was on the run, but they weren't able to get to them at their time frame. The person had to come on their own. Just just a little interesting tidbit in one of the few details that we actually get from law enforcement on this case. We can see the community rallying around here at a candlelight vigil. Uh, it brought family, friends, and strangers to the David School to celebrate the life of Amber Spradlin. She was a 2003 graduate of the David School and was an advocate for the organization. Her aunt, Melissa Sammons, said, it fills my heart and my soul to think people who really don't know Spradlin would step up and help support us. Uh, Melissa, there's a lot more of these people out here. Um, and I'm talking about you guys. Brian Lafferty, president of the David School. Amber loved this school, and I thought it was important to show that the school loved and appreciated Amber. So we definitely have a good, caring community circling around this family in a very, very tough situation. Here we have a picture from the vigil as well with some of her family members. This was all the David School's doing, Hall said. They just asked if we would want to have it, and they took it from there. Amber wasn't just my cousin. She was my best friend, sidekick, and as I jokingly told her, my personal assistant, Hall said during the ceremony. She had a beautiful smile and something nice to say to everyone. She loved gatherings, so she would be thrilled to see everyone here tonight. And of course, there is an obituary written up for Amber. Just wanted to share a little bit from this as well. Amber Nicole Spradlin, 38 years old of Prestonsburg, Kentucky, passed away Sunday, June 18th in Martin, Kentucky. She was a member of the Prestonsburg Church of God and worked as a hostess. She survived by her aunts and uncles, step-siblings, cousins, many special friends, and her two loving cats, Sadie and Twinkles. Um, they did arrange the funeral. It was Saturday, June 24th at 1 p.m. in the Hall Funeral Home Chapel. Amber was buried in the Davidson Memorial Gardens in Ivel, Kentucky. In lieu of flowers, the family asks that memorial contributions be made to the Floyd County Animal Shelter. Just another beautiful way to honor Amber and her love of animals. And here is a photo of her aunt's mourning at the funeral that happened on June 24th. In a statement issued on June 27th, attorney Mark Wollander uh, spoke on behalf of Spradlin's family, saying the family has questions as to those who were at Dr. Michael McKinney's house 
located on Arkansas Creek Road, Martin, Kentucky, in the early hours of Sunday, June 18th, 2023. Uh, let's go back to the map real quick, and we can see Prestonsburg, actually just a little south of that is Arkansas Creek Road. Uh, looks like a small community of some large homes, and that's just a little bit outside of Martin that we can see here, uh, just west of Arkansas Creek Road. So this is the area where the home is, and all that a bit south of Prestonsburg. Actually, I've got a map pulled up. Uh, the Brick House is the name of the restaurant, where apparently she worked until just before midnight, and then her, her boss, and someone described as her friend, uh, left. And we can see that the total miles is just 10.4 miles, about a 20-minute drive from the Brick House to that home. The family has learned that along with Dr. McKinney, his son, Michael K. McKinney, Roy Kidd, that's the person that is described as Amber's friend, uh, and there were at least two other individuals at the home when Amber was brutally murdered. So, uh, yeah, yeah, we're talking five other individuals, including Amber. She would be the sixth person that was there. And there's a possibility there's more. The family continues to support and thank Captain Randall Serber and the men and women of the Kentucky State Police for their dedication and involvement in the investigation of Amber's murder. The family has complete confidence that those responsible will be brought to justice. So we now know the man's name, Dr. Michael McKinney. Uh, it's kind of interesting because when I first ran this Google Earth, if we go back to Prestonsburg and kind of drill in on the center of town. There's an interesting... Notice that comes up right next to the center. Michael K. McKinney, DMD. This must be the dentist office right there. Um, let's see if we can learn a little bit more about him. I did run a search and came across floydcountysmiles.com. Here we have a photo of him. And I'm, I just want to be clear. We have no idea who is responsible for what happened. Uh, is he considered a person of interest in this case? I would certainly think so. Is he a suspect? Not at all. We don't know what's going on with this case. Dr. Michael K. McKinney Jr. is a 94 graduate of the University of Kentucky College of Dentistry. He's practiced in his native Floyd County since 1994. He attended Allen Central High School and then received his bachelor's degree from Moorhead State University. He's been married to his wife, LaDonna, since 1996, and they are the proud parents of Michael K. McKinney III. He enjoys traveling and all sports, including basketball and football. He's an avid UK football and basketball fan. This is kind of the, the basics of him. And it's interesting to hear that uh, he's got a long-term marriage as well. I have not seen any information confirming if his wife is part of one of the other individuals that was in the home during this. Um, the only thing we have seen from that last statement was some confirmation that his son is certainly one of the individuals that was there. In terms of Roy Kidd, the only really thing, the only real thing that I came up with was uh, this LinkedIn where it mentions he's a senior radiographer at Highlands ARH Medical Center. And that's kind of bringing me to an interesting point about all this. Uh, let's assume there was some breakdown with the 911 system and medical help wasn't dispatched correctly for some reason. We have a dentist, admittedly. He's, he's a dentist. He's, you know, it's, it's not the same as a general practitioner. I understand that. But we have someone that has some medical experience on hand. We have another person here that works at a local medical center. Actually, let me go ahead and bring up a map. How far are these medical centers? Like, if they had to go get their own help or take Amber to a hospital how far would that be well if we're talking about the medical center where roy kidd works that would have been about a 20 minute drive uh just over 16 miles a, a bit of a drive for sure but there's actually a hospital closer like very close within five minutes less than three miles away is our lady of the way hospital from arkansas creek road so even if there was some breakdown in terms of emergency services, as long as someone in that house was going to try to be helpful to this situation, they could have had her at the doors of a hospital within a five minute drive. And that also didn't happen. Instead, based on what we're hearing from these statements, uh, hours pass. 
before eventually some type of law enforcement response happens. And we don't know. There might be another phone call that triggered that later. Um, some of the stuff that I'm seeing, I, I don't want to lean on it too hard, but I'm seeing that there was a third phone call that was basically saying that there is there's a body at, at this house. Um, and I don't I don't know. I don't know, guys. It's just it's very, very troubling when you're talking about a hospital that is a five minute drive away. Um, of course, with the nature of this attack and the type of wounds that have been described, it seems pretty clear that whoever was the person conducting this attack had no intention of getting her to a hospital. What's bothering me is there are other people that are part of this. And how could not one of them step up in this situation? That's really, really troubling to me. Uh, anyway, Roy Kidd, it noted here, is a senior radiographer. Uh, basically performs x-rays and other diagnostic imaging examinations on patients. So we've been dancing around it. Questions raised about the 911 service. Let's learn a little bit more about this issue. Dr. Debbie Hall, a cousin of Amber Spradlin, asked, what police agency is responsible for responding to 911 calls? This is basically, she's asking this at a, a public meeting of the Floyd County Fiscal Court. And this is where they gave a public comments section. They said, if you're in the public, you need to talk to us about something in terms of our budgeting. Uh, you know, the floor is open. So Dr. Debbie Hall takes the floor and she's asking who's responsible for responding to these 911 calls. Uh, she said she was told by the Floyd County Sheriff's Office and Kentucky State Police that the Prestonsburg Police Department was the agency responsible for responding. County Attorney Keith Bartley agreed saying the city has a contract with the county to handle 911 calls. If anybody says different, they're lying to you, Bartley said. Well, they're lying, Hall replied. They have stood and lied directly to my face. The mayor stood right here in this room, not five feet behind where you're standing right now, and said, we will take every call outside of Prestonburg's limits, Prestonsburg's limits, and we'll send you the bill, fiscal court, if you enter into this contract and five minutes later, they entered into the contract, Bartley said. Now, that's the truth. So Bartley's insisting that according to how this contract works, um, 911, the call center would be moved to Prestonsburg, and they would dispatch those calls out from there, and there's some type of billing that would happen back for calls that were outside of Preston, Prestonsburg's city limits. She continued, my cousin is sitting in the funeral home because she was brutally murdered and I don't have the records yet, but supposedly there was at least one, if not two, or maybe even three 911 calls that went out before she was murdered. Um, we don't, I don't know. We don't have the details. Even she's saying here, she doesn't have the details. So I don't know how many of those calls happened um, before her death. Um she also said, it's too late for Amber Spradlin. She's dead. She was innocent and it's too late for her. But let me tell you what, everybody in here has family members. It will happen to somebody in here and you'll be in the same situation as me and my family. Now, unfortunately, this isn't the only example of issues with this 911 system. In the press conference that was held by the family and their attorney, he mentioned another instance where someone had called into 911. There was a family dispute that was happening. They were saying, someone's going to get shot if you guys don't get out here. And the response did not happen timely. And when law enforcement got out there, there was someone with a gunshot wound. So there seems to be some very big issue going on here. Prestonsburg Mayor Les Stapleton was not present at the fiscal court meeting during Hall's and Martin's comments, but he said in an interview with the Floyd County Chronicle and Times after the meeting that Bartley's statements were incorrect. So now we're going to get into what is this policy? Do they really understand what this policy is? Uh, on December 12th, 2022, the Floyd County Fiscal Court approved a resolution to outsource the 911 dispatch service to the city of Prestonsburg, according to court documents. This was after they received a notification that dispatch service charges from the Kentucky State Police would be nearly doubling for 2023. So essentially, the old 911 operations handled by KSP said, we're going to have to raise our rates for these calls that we're dispatching to you guys. And I've heard it 
explained that way in a few places. And I've heard that there was actually other challenges as well that had to do more with records access. Like if they got a call for Prestonsburg, they wouldn't have a way to really access um, the records for that call. There was some type of systems gap as well. So it seems like once Prestonsburg heard that the, the rate was going to go up, they're like, oh, we'll just bring it in house. We're going to do it here in the city and then we'll make money by charging the county calls back out to everyone else. I don't know. And it might address the fiscal issues. I don't know if it addresses some of the communications issues when it came to when it came to those records, getting those records released and moved to the appropriate department so they could act on them. And it certainly doesn't it doesn't address another issue, which is the staffing of law enforcement, which, which basically the mayor is going to bring up as we get into more comments from him. But I'm trying to keep this conversation on track, it's really, really hard with this 911 aspect with how political it is. It just it it's definitely a hot point. Judge Executive Robbie Williams said, Every, everyone's going through the dispatch. This isn't an issue that just started in the last six months. This has been going on since I've been in office. He said that one of the reasons the 911 dispatch now operates from the city police department instead of the state police post nine is for adequate access. We didn't have access to that data in Pikeville at all. If there's something going on in that system, or if we had an incident and I needed information from the dispatch in Pikeville, I had to file an open records request to get that information. And we're paying them to provide that service for us. So the decision was made to move it based on the fact that we needed to have that information in order to find out how we're gonna address these issues. There's been deficiencies. So basically, even his statement here is saying it's a first step to try to take on these other issues of information access that are plaguing these departments. And this is something that we've talked about on the channel way too often, just uh, cross coordination between different police departments can be very, very tough. And we're talking about maybe a bit of a more rural area here. Um, maybe they don't have the most up-to-date computer systems that you might have in a metropolitan area their mayor would tell you, yes, they do. They have everything that they need, but I'm just trying to be fair with this. I don't think they're dealing with the same types of budgets that you might have in a major metropolitan area and the types of systems that come with those budgets. Um, so this seemed like it was a first step to try to address those problems, but six months down the road, you know, that's a pretty short time frame for trying to fix a problem of this nature. Uh, William said that police response is one of those deficiencies. We've got to get it addressed. I know you're saying around the country that everyone, if there's a 911 call, they respond. I think they mean county. In Floyd County, that has not been the case. Now, how do we make it better? We're trying to figure it out. Of course, Hall says trying is not good enough. So the mayor then releases his statement and starts it of course, trying to respect the family. On behalf of myself and the entire city of Prestonsburg, I would like to offer my heartfelt condolences to the family and friends of Amber Spradlin. We will not muddy the water with rumor and conjecture as a takeaway from the good work that the Kentucky State Police is doing. I've been accused, lied to, and about. Those who I lead have been dragged through the mud as, result of, as a result of total fabrication. In the December 2022 fiscal court meeting, I made it clear, as you see below, that when the resources were available, if our police are needed, we will do our best and try to assist, as we always have, as it is reflected in the dispatching contract. So what I'm taking from this is he's saying that, um, once again, his city is the priority and he's not promising any, res he's not promising response outside in the other areas of the county. He's saying, if we can, we will, essentially. Is that the type of thing you want to hear about a 911 response at all? The city of Prestonburg's police is a stellar organization supported by a stellar 911 center. They offer around the clock police protection 365 days a year, but their priority is and must be the city of Prestonsburg as they are the taxpayers who fund the department's existence. With that priority, we still have done our absolute best to assist outside of town when resources allow us. It also includes a little video statement. And, and by the way, I just, I, I just, I'm really bothered at the, at the political hot point here, but also don't wrap this message in, hey, we're really sorry to the family and friends of Amber Spradlin. 
and then we're throwing all caps in the middle of this statement about the dispatching contract. It just, any goodwill that came at the start of this message, by the time I got to the end of it, I just wasn't feeling it. But let's go ahead and uh, hear it from the mayor himself. What I want to say to start off with is, I told them right up front, we are not the initial police agency. We're not going to be. If the state police or the sheriff's office cannot, and it's an emergency situation, we would try to do it. But our first priority is to assist the Prestonburg and keep people here. We'd have to call somebody out to cover. That's expenses we have to incur. All right. So what I'm troubled by in that statement is he's talking about a boomerang. Like basically he's saying the 911 call comes into us for something outside in the county. We're going to try to push it out to the state police. If they tell us they can't get to it, then they're supposed to contact them back somehow, Prestonsburg, and say, hey, we can't get to that right now. And then Prestonsburg kind of has the option of, well, yeah, I don't know. If we have a spare officer, yeah, go ahead and send them. If we don't, then what? Like you literally have a black hole in your process where a 911 call can go and just disappear. And we're wondering why there's a few different stories in this area about 911 calls not being responded to for hours. How can that black hole exist? It is really, really troubling. And there's a chance, there's a chance that if one of those 911 calls was serviced differently, maybe Amber could still be alive today. Uh, over at floydct.com, they note that they, the County Chronicle and Times, along with other news outlets, they filed an open records request with Prestonsburg Mayor Les Stapleton asking for any and all logs. So they just want the logs. They get that the 911 calls are part of an investigation, but they wanted the logs for Saturday, June 17th and Sunday, June 18th, as well as calls made by Amber to the 911 center on June 18th. The request was denied by the interim police chief, Russ Shirt Shirtliff, uh, which I also want to point out because it's come up as one of the talking points in terms of a conspiracy with this case. I guess the original police chief quit very soon after this case broke. Who knows what it's related to? I have no idea. Um, it, it's kind of leaning into that conspiracy theory, I think, about some type of, you know, affluent businessman being able to pull strings all of a sudden the police chief quits like it's some type of aspect of a a big conspiracy at that level i don't know that it is it could be that just you know uh, another case in prestonsburg coming off of what's going on with the candy green gonzalez case might have just been too much for this police chief and he's like i'm out like this what's what's going on around here um there's there's reasons why people quit jobs every day but anyway so uh, the request for just the logs of the 911 call, calls denied, but some information does come out. The Prestonsburg 911 Center did not at any time on June 18th or in the days leading up to June 18th receive a call, 911 or otherwise, from Amber Spradlin. So Amber is not one of the people that called 911, which really blows my mind because I'm trying to imagine what's going on in this home and wondering why no one is trying to help in this situation. It seems like someone might have been trying to, but then just stopped or maybe, maybe they called. And then this is something that was kind of theorized and actually more than theorized. But once again, they weren't citing their sources on that Nancy Grace podcast. Um, that there was a first call about, oh, someone's been attacked here. They need help. And then they called back and was like, oh, no, 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 everything's fine. You guys don't have to come. That essentially the 911 call was kind of called off in a subsequent call. Um, we don't we don't know. We're not getting anywhere near that level of, of information or understanding from this. But certainly a possibility. But I'm, it's just, I'm like, if no calls came in, I get it. Everyone in the house is covering for someone. But see, it seems like someone was trying to poke outside of that. And then, I don't know, maybe other, maybe they were threatened by the others or something. I, I don't know. I feel just tapped out on this 911 thing, but I just want to be fair to both sides of the conversation. And uh, the mayor does also note that, hey, look, this is a matter of, look, they know they're receiving the calls. So their call center is working on that front. It's just when they put 
the dispatch call out and they ask for help from law enforcement, if there are no officers available because all the sheriffs are having a meeting, then what happens? No one's going to be dispatched. And that's really an issue with law enforcement side. They're understaffed. They might be underfunded. There might be other things affecting that, but there's some problem in terms of they can receive the call, but what good is it if the law enforcement end isn't there in some way to pick it up, which kind of, I think, rolls back to why people were wondering about, well, can Prestonsburg then take the call and you know send someone out in that case? I mean, we're, we're talking about areas that are a matter of a f- five minute drive, 10 minute drive, uh, I guess 20 minutes to that house in particular at most, but in the middle of the night, I don't know. We don't know the exact time that the phone call came in, but we know the time frame in terms of Amber leaving work was leading right up to midnight. So we are, we're talking in the middle of the night. We had no one that we could dispatch. All right, just to roll it back to some other details that came out during the family's press conference. According to the family, on the night of her murder, Amber was with a friend that she had known for years and several other people. And I'm sure she felt very safe with him too, said Hall. From the seasons in, the party progressed to his home. Uh, So there was actually another stop. They didn't go directly from the brick house to the home on Arkansas Creek. They stopped at another location called the Seasons Inn here. And it would have probably been around or just after midnight. So I don't know if they might have another bar there, um, something along those lines. Let me just see if there's even a street view on this. There we go. Yep, Seasons Inn. Motel and restaurant. So maybe they would have had a bar that was still open as part of this restaurant. It's kind of weird to me to go for, I mean, I get that you work at a restaurant, but if you want to have a drink or something like, I don't know, I don't know why you would have stopped here in particular. But anyway, from this location, they, they do wind up going back to the house. Hall continues, I can just imagine her screaming and trying to fight back. She was 4'11". She had no defense. These monsters that did this to her. Uh, Wallander said that the local law enforcement agencies need to come together to find a better solution to the 911 center. I, I don't know who could disagree with that. This is ridiculous. What was it about? Money, he said. Is a person's life more important than money? It's a great question. Debbie Hall spoke at the press conference about what she's been going on with since Amber's death. My nights are filled with visions of what happened to her. I don't know the terror that she had, the fear that she had screaming. I could just imagine her screaming and trying to fight back. Now, Wolander was also very clear at the press conference that he thinks law enforcement is on this and doing a good job. But he did say, quote, don't expect any arrests for a couple months. I can share a little bit about what I've heard. It was brutal. There was blood everywhere, blood mixed with other blood and other DNA. There have been a couple dozen search warrants executed. They're looking at cell phones, computers, text messages, GPS, cell tower information. It's not a cover up. You don't want to arrest the wrong people for the wrong things. I've got nothing but praise for the state police. Now, the state police do provide an update in July, July 12th of 2023. Troopers, basically, they say this isn't just foul play or they're thinking it's foul play anymore. They now consider it a full murder investigation. They said that physical evidence, including DNA evidence, has been submitted to the labs and those results are pending. So um, even though they very quickly came out and said it was foul play, they've now switched gears in mid-July and they're going full-blown homicide investigation. Uh, WYMT notes that some false reports are taking time away from the murder investigation. I've kind of spoken to this already, so I don't want to retread it too strongly. Um But I just want to kind of get the family's thoughts and comments on this. This is a quote from Amber's cousin, Cassidy. She says, we have all the faith in the state police to do their investigation and to do their jobs well. But at the same time, knowing that how she passed and that the person or people who did that are still living their lives is a tough pill to swallow right now, which I certainly get. Her cousin, McKenna Osborne, said, we appreciate your support. Because behind all those theories, that's truly what I think people are trying to give is their support and their love to us. But 
we would just urge them to wait until their statements made that are factual and use the facts to kind of go forward. And she's basically just pointing out some of those calls that came in and have been flooding the investigators and sending them off on tangents with the investigation that turn out to be someone on TikTok released a video that said this, and there's really no information that backs it outside of that. The Floyd County Chronicle noted later in July um, that Am Amber's family finally met with the city of Prestonsburg and the fiscal court and had some information shared with them about those 911 calls. Uh, this is according to a press release. This meeting provided the family with information we had not previously been made aware of and has generated a better understanding of the role the 911 center played in the handling of the call, the release said. So this might be the type of comment that I was talking about before. Like maybe they had someone finally go and do some analysis, pull the logs, get just an overview about what's happening in those calls something that wouldn't risk the investigation and then privately have a meeting with the family and relay that information to them so that they know, okay, we don't have to be figureheads for this big 911 call center dispute. That's really not a factor in this particular case. It, I don't know if, it, if that's their outcome with it, but at least the first part of that did happen. Some information was relayed to her family about this. Though we still have questions regarding the incident, we are focused on ensuring Amber's killer or killers are brought to justice and prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Therefore, we will not release any further information at this time. If that data was scrubbed accurately enough where they knew it wasn't going to harm the investigation, and if it really proved that the 911 center wasn't a big piece in this, I'm very surprised that they wouldn't have released that publicly. We don't know for sure, but I'm just saying if... If they had that type of proof with a hot button issue like this, I think they would have just rolled that out through the media. They did also say that the meeting opened the door for future communications that we hope will ensure that the major stakeholders are at the table moving forward. So it seems like that was, honestly, I think it was a bit more of a touch on the 911 issue and maybe how that issue is related to Amber's case. But this is uh, a week ago um, from today and demonstrators still out there. On July 28th, demonstrators gathered in downtown Prestonsburg to show their support for the movement seeking justice for Amber. The protest was a walk in front of various sites, including the Brick House restaurant. And you can see this man there wearing a, or carrying a sign that says it all. Just tell the truth. And of course, just want to end on a note, on a few notes from Amber's family. They're not going to let this go. Uh, of course, we're going to keep tabs on it as well. I am looking forward to hearing about an arrest in this case. Um, if that doesn't happen for some reason and we see that the family is ramping up their efforts and if they're starting to give out more details, uh, of course, we're going to share that with you guys here. But her aunt, Melissa, said, once her body is buried, there's other stuff that's not buried. We're not going to lay down and let this be covered up. We're going to keep on until this person gets what they deserve. And Amber's uncle, Gary, said, whoever did this, they need to pay. And that is definitely true. Uh, now, we've got contact information in the description box down below, and you might notice something a little different down there. Uh, the Golden Law Office, who is also representing the family, uh, they've kind of added themselves in terms of looking for information about this case. And yes, part of it is about the 911 aspect, but also about the murder of Amber. So we're going to have their contact information down below as well. If you do have some tip to call in, uh, please go ahead and call it in to the official number that we have down there. But I'd say uh, if, if you're really looking to help the family, if it's that type of information, also send it into the Golden Law Office. Um, other links you'll find down below will be the Facebook group Justice for Amber. Please feel free to join, show, their, show them your support as well. And I have another link down there for the Floyd County Animal Shelter. You might remember that is um, where they wanted, instead of flowers, they wanted people to make donations in Amber's name. 
We've already done that. A big thank you to everyone that supports us here at the channel. We made a donation in Amber's name earlier today. But if you want to do the same, I'm going to have this whole post linked down there because they have a mailing address you can use, P.O. Box 1502, Prestonsburg, Kentucky, 41653. There's also a PayPal. Please note, the PayPal is called something else, but I've confirmed in the comments down below this is the proper PayPal. It's called the Pay Dewey Damn Dog and Cat Protection Society. So that link is also in the description box down below. If you want to help honor Amber's memory, please join us in making a donation there. Uh, despite me sounding somewhat critical about how the information is presented on this show, I did use Crime Stories with Nancy Grace to get us a bit of an understanding about this case. Uh, I will have a link to that down below as well. So that's the information that I was able to find on this case. Some of the other rumors swirling around, even mentioned in the Nancy Grace podcast, they, they touched on, but in a very passive way, that there's some type of drug use that might have been going on around all this. I found no confirmation of anything like that going on. Um, I think they mentioned that Roy Kidd was the person that actually has the injury that's part of that mixed blood DNA profile that they're trying to work with. I found no other source confirming that, and they did not mention their source cited. It was like, people told me, basically, was the source they cited. Um, also, that it took four hours to respond to the 911 call. I did not find that. I did find the mayor, uh, when he was, one of the other issues was brought up, that story I told you about the um, family members having the dispute and saying someone's going to get shot if you guys don't get out here. Uh, I believe the attorney said that it took three or four hours for that response to happen. And the mayor was like, that's not even true. And he provided an analysis that basically rolled up to like two hours. So we were still talking a, a significant problem there. Outside of that, a lot of talk about the possibility of a cover-up happening in this. Um, and, you know, there's, there's two levels to that. Do I personally think that there's some form of cover-up that's happening within the home, within the people that were in the home at that time? I think that that's likely because of the delay that we're seeing in terms of, a, of an arrest. Something outside of that happening in the community, I have not got any beat on that. I haven't found anything pointing towards that. Um, we have that one little wrinkle with the police chief stepping away from his position. But like I said, that could be anything. You never know. He might've got a medical diagnosis. I mean, there's so many other things that could happen. You just don't know. Um, so for all those rumors, there's nothing that's really grabbing me in terms of them and, and moving them forward. What we do know is we have Dr. Michael McKinney. It's his house. He's the owner of the restaurant. She was with him. She was with Roy Kidd, who's described as a friend of hers. Michael McKinney's son was in the house. And then, according to what the family says, possibly two additional people as well. We know that the dentist is married. Is one of those two people his wife? Maybe. Uh, we've, we've seen numerous mentions of the mixed blood, and I think that might be part of the challenge in terms of processing the DNA. Um, outside of that, 911 call, not made by Amber. What happened in those calls, I'm sure is going to be a very important part of any prosecution with this case. So I really don't expect that we're going to hear anything about those calls. Sometimes when an arrest happens, some of the details that lead to that arrest um, or, or that some of the stronger points of the case will come out. So at that point, we might get a little clip of one of the calls or even just uh, a transcript of this is what was said in that call and the call was made by that person. But I wouldn't expect much more information than that until hopefully um, a court case on this for, uh, for murder charges which I know the family's hoping for too. Uh, a big thank you to everyone that helps keep us here on the channel uh, and always with limited commercials. That's both for you and the families that we're trying to help here. I want to thank PayPal supporters, Brandy Fry, Hillary Green, and Angela Welch Sola. If you'd like to support our work here, please visit lordandarts.com. There you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or even just buy us a coffee like Mike recently did. We really appreciate everyone that helps us do this work here and make donations like we did in Amber's honor today. Take care, everyone. I'm John Lorden. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you again here next week on the Lorden Arts Channel.